Good evening, everybody. As principal, it's my very great pleasure to introduce this inaugural lecture, Fingers, Lips, and Parchment, How Medieval Users Handled Their Manuscripts, by Professor Catherine Rudy. Professor Catherine Rudy, or Kate, is one of the foremost art historians working with medieval manuscripts today. Kate is in every way an exceptional researcher for she has the capacity to approach medieval material culture with a new vitality and insight. Indeed, vitality is an apt word for Kate who extends her passion and enthusiasm for research into all areas of her academic life and especially her teaching. She has a wonderful ability to think outside the box, or indeed one might say outside the book, as well as inside it, as we'll hear, and to encourage others to do so too. Kate's detailed understanding of how medieval people created and experienced textual culture in manuscript and also in print is often radical and far-reaching. Her research is living proof of why we need universities to encourage and enable us to interrogate and reimagine the past, and in so doing, to enhance our cultural understanding. We are exceptionally proud to have Kate as a member of our <coughs> faculty. Kate obtained her Bachelor of Arts degree in the History of Art from Cornell University, graduating summa cum laude in 1992. She then progressed to Columbia University, where she attained her Master of Arts in 1996, her Master of Philosophy in 1997, and her Doctor of Philosophy in 2001, with a dissertation entitled Northern European Visual Responses to Holy Land Pilgrimage, 1453 to 1550. After completing her doctorate, Kate became Andrew Mellon Fellow at the University of Toronto's Pontifical Institute of Medieval Studies, where in 2002 she qualified for a licentiate in medieval studies with a paper entitled Devotional Time, Rubrics and Nuns, the Day, Week and Year in Netherlandish Convents in the Late Middle Ages. And if I had time, I would um, give you a whole uh, excursus on the many brilliant titles that uh, Kate comes up with for her <laughs> papers, but that's uh, another uh, lecture. Following a student career spent mostly in the US and Canada, Kate's academic career is marked by a series of appointments at prestigious institutions, primarily in Europe. And she left the University of Toronto in 2002 to assume a postdoctoral fellowship at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She left Utrecht in 2005 for a year-long fellowship at the Warburg Institute in London before moving to the National Library of the Netherlands where she spent three years as curator of illuminated manuscripts, during which time she was able to facilitate research on the library's collection of 220 manuscripts. She departed the Netherlands for a fellowship at the Courtauld Institute of Art in 2009, and it was here that Kate conducted her groundbreaking research project Dirty Books, Quantifying Patterns of Use in Medieval Manuscripts Using a den Densitometer, the employment of which tool Kate pioneered in the field of art history in order to measure the grime deposited upon medieval manuscripts, thereby enlightening us as to how they were handled by users. And as somebody who has worked on a very large number of Scottish medieval manuscripts, I can tell you they really would repay uh, work with a densitometer. <laughs> After leaving the Courtauld Institute for a short visiting fellowship at Trinity College Dublin at the end of 2010, Kate's scholarship eventually brought her to St Andrews, where she was appointed lecturer in 2011. She became senior lecturer in 2014 and was appointed professor of art history in 2017. Alongside these roles, Kate has held leadership positions within the School of Art History, including Director of Postgraduate Students, Director of Research, and Deputy Head of School. Kate has published widely throughout her academic career. Her first solo book, St Anne in the National Library of the Netherlands, was published in 2017, in which year, uh, sorry, 2007, in which year Kate also co-edited two volumes, 
one of which, weaving, veiling, and dressing, textiles and their metaphors in the late medieval ages, speaks to another of Kate's great practices and passions, weaving. She is a talented artistic weaver who has exhibited her remarkable creations to great acclaim. Since 2007, Kate has co-edited another volume and has written and published five further books, including Postcards on Parchment, The Social Lives of Medieval Books, and Piety in Pieces, How Medieval Readers Customise Their Manuscripts. Her latest book published this year is entitled Image, Knife and Glue Pot, Early Assemblage in Manuscript and Print. This evening's lecture complements the subject of Kate's next book entitled Touching Skin, How Medieval Users Rubbed, Touched and Kissed Their Manuscripts, which will be published next year. In addition to her outstanding research, Kate is a widely respected and even beloved tutor. This formulation, I should say, stems from my current executive assistant who was taught by her, whose students value the individual attention she affords them the authoritative knowledge that she demonstrates in her teaching, both at undergraduate and postgraduate levels, and the warmth and humour with which she unceasingly conducts herself. Indeed, this latter point is something appreciated by all who know Kate. Her enthusiasm for manuscripts, and indeed any subject to which she turns her attention, is infectious and works to make her subject utterly enthralling, a gift often appreciated by occasionally sleep-deprived or worse for wear students. And that point also comes from my current executive assistant. <laughs> Kate's outstanding research career has been recognized in two distinguished ways this year. In January, she was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of Edinburgh. And in April, she was the recipient of a highly prestigious Leverhulme major research grant, which will, until 2022, support her research project measuring medieval users' responses to manuscripts, new technological approaches. After tonight's lecture, a vote of thanks will be given by the Dean of Arts, Professor Frank Lorenz Muller. You're then all warmly invited to a drinks reception in Lower College Hall. So I'm now delighted to welcome Professor Catherine Rudy to give her inaugural lecture, Fingers, Lips and Parchment, How Medi Medieval Users Handled Their Manuscripts. Kate. Oh, thank you so much. It's amazing to see uh, so many of you out here tonight. Um, it is a great pleasure to be here, and I am uh, grateful to the principal for the very warm introduction. Now, in Thinking about how medieval users handled their manuscripts, my story begins with six openings from this little Delft book of ours. And you can see that the openings I've chosen here each have a full page miniature uh, opposite uh, some text. And I know this manuscript from my time as curator at the Royal Library in the Netherlands and was able to spend time with some of the dirty, grimy things, not just the beautiful things that are generally put on the internet by museums and collections. And what is interesting about this is that you'll see that the enunciation at the top left is a little bit dirty. Uh, the, uh, the image of the crucifixion is slightly less dirty. And the uh, St. Sebastian over here on the right is filthy. And I wanted to see whether there was a way to take these terms a little bit more, slightly less, and super filthy, and to throw some numbers at them to give a quantitative approach to dirt. And so there enters the densitometer, um, which is a machine for measuring the optical density of a reflecting surface. And so what I did here was to, uh, to take a reading at the top corner of the Book of Hours, where it was never handled, and then zero the scale to that uh, area, then take a reading at the juiciest point of the, the big fingerprint at the bottom, where the book would be held open continuously. It has to be held open because it's made on animal skin, and otherwise it would snap shut. And so those fingerprints uh, can be measured. And in this case, we've got a number 21, uh, which is on a logarithmic scale. Put all of these measurements into a spreadsheet and then generate a graph. And this graph then shows us 
which parts of the manuscript were most used and which parts were less used. And you can see that the largest area under the curve corresponds to the hours of the Virgin. And uh, there are lots of spikes in the suffrages that correspond to individual saints, including that Saint Sebastian. We can also see that um, in that big area of the hours of the Virgin, that at the very end of that text, the area that represents the hour of Compline, so the reading to be done late at night, we get a distinctive drop off. This is where <laughs> the person fell asleep about a third of the time. So thinking about how a medieval manuscripts um, can reveal their signs of wear and give us a kind of object biography that's inscribed in the muck and the dirt of the pages themselves, led me to think about other kinds of dirt that might be in books. So for example, here we see uh, a little book of ours, very modest, and somebody has added a text, Illumina oculos meos, illuminate my eyes. And at the top of this page, we have candle wax dripped on the top. So somebody has literally illuminated his or her eyes while reading this page. Or in this little book of hours, uh, which is a Netherlandish book of hours made for export to England, this is the only page in the book, the only opening in the book, that is quite damaged. And you can see that it's been wet damaged. And I suspect that it has been taken out in the rain. Now, this particular opening is for the Vigil of the Dead. And the corresponding miniature shows uh, the raising of Lazarus. And what probably happened is that uh, the user of this book was thinking about a, a, a recently deceased person and took the book out to a grave site, and it was raining that day. And in doing so, we can imagine the lay owner of this manuscript copying the behavior of a priest or a deacon, such as uh, in this example I'm showing you on the left, where uh, the priest has a uh, breviary, he's taking it out to uh, an, uh, an open hole in the ground where um, a worker is sliding the sarcophagus into the ground. And so here, the idea here is that lay people copied the behavior, including the behavior with books, uh, from the figures of authority whom they were witnessing. So in this case, lay people are copying priests. And once you start seeing this kind of pattern, you see it everywhere. Um, and so dozens of little books of ours, such as this, um, which is on very fine parchment, have the same text, The Vigil of the Dead, which has been uniquely uh, made wet pockmarked uh, and destroyed partly from rainwater. Now, this is one of my favorite examples. This is a rubricated noted ritual manuscript uh, made in England in the mid 15th century. And it's been splashed for uh, a different reason in a different context. Namely, in the short space of its 92 folios, it's been repeatedly wetted with an aspergillum um, and it and including this area, which is uh, containing instructions for the rites of death. And we can imagine a scene like this one, uh, where an officiant is using an uh, uh, aspergillum with a bucket of holy water, uh, where the bucket of holy water is so close to the book as to make any librarian gasp. And this same manuscript has instructions for other kinds of rituals, including um, a baptism ritual. And here you see where a wet baby has been dripped over this manuscript, causing, in particular, the rubrication to liquefy and um, squish around on the page. And I think what we're seeing at the bottom of the margin here is um, some baby detritus uh, that has also leaked onto the page. This is the singular most uh, dirty page in the manuscript. Now, the big idea here, um, besides that the entire book has been baptized, is that, that book handling is self-documenting and that the book gives us this evidence of how it has been handled. It gives us part of its object biography that is inscribed cumulatively over uh, the period of its use, which could be decades or even a century. 
Now, I want to move now to, uh, to thinking from inadvertent kinds of wear that I've just shown you to looking at targeted wear, places in books where a user has volitionally touched particular parts of the page or the book and where we can see those um, appear again cumulatively. And the, the most important uh, category of these are missiles. So beginning in about the 12th century, priests used missiles to conduct mass. This kind of liturgical manuscript uh, shows uh, a, a big image of Christ crucified opposite the prayer that begins te igator. And the instructions for use of a missile indicated that the priest was to kiss the, the book, kiss the image of Christ. But uh, illuminators realized that this would damage the page and they began making little targets, like kiss targets, down at the bottom of the page. But you can see from this evidence that the kiss target wasn't wasn't uh, enough to, to draw the lips of the priest every time, and his lips actually went right up the axis of, the, of Christ's body. Now, over and over again, we see that um, priests kissed uh, books in a particular way. And one of my arguments is that the ritualized habit of kissing results in kissing the same way and the same place every time. It's a kind of habit, the way you have a habit of taking out your phone or, or, um, or parking the same way or whatever kinds of daily habits you have. Uh, a priest would kiss the same place every time. Now here we can see that this priest kissed the right hand of the father over and over again. And that has caused abrasion and cumulative wear at that particular place. Now, I can say two things about the priest who had this manuscript. He, first of all, was very consistent in kissing the foot of the cross. And second, he had facial hair like a Brillo pad. <laughs> <laughs> and in this manuscript, we can see that the priest grasped the book by the bottom. Here's my prop over and over again, and we have all of this wear at the bottom margins uh, over on the recto and verso sides of, of this opening. But there's no damage to the image itself. And it's as if the, the priest is holding up the book and giving it air kisses. So we can measure that as well. Now, this little book of ours, which is about the quarter of the size of uh, the missile I've just been showing you, was owned by a lay person in England. Now you can see that it is also heavily worn. Now part of my argument is that laypersons copy the behavior of those in authority, including priests. And so what we have here is uh, the layperson who owned this little book of ours uh, putting his uh, or her lips to the image and also grasping it. The parchment now has the texture of a chamois cloth and it doesn't hold the, uh, the, the paint very well. It's thrown the paint right off uh, and you can see that the decoration is now missing. Now how do I know that this is uh, done with a face, done with kissing directly, lips on the page? Well, looking at the reverse of this particular miniature shows this. So the facial grease uh, from the mouth has stained right through the page. It's lapidinous, and it goes right through the book. Um, a second thing to notice is that uh, there's some moisture in the kiss, uh, but uh, which would uh, cause the paint to liquefy. But the, the greasy stains are uh, hydrophobic and don't make the, uh, the paint reconstitute and stick to the other side. So another way in which late medieval people uh, touched their books was with a finger. And this is especially true if the target was too small. So in this case, I'm showing you uh, another missile, but this time the missile doesn't have a fancy full page image of Christ crucified, it just has a, a few uh, decorated initials made in gold and paint. And here's a close up of the Te Igator initial and what you can see here is that the priest has used his finger to transport his breath and the kiss from his body to the body of the book. 
and that has wetted the black ink that uh, circumscribes the gold and caused that to liquefy and squash outward. And we now get a very nice fingerprint of this uh, priest's uh, possibly index finger. Now, again, lay people copy this kind of behavior. And here I'm showing you uh, a Psalter, a 15th century English Psalter that was probably owned by a lay person. And it has historiated initials showing David in various postures of prayer at the major text divisions. Now here what you can see is that the owner wetted his finger, um, touched the image of David in prayer, and then found that he had a finger full of red paint and wiped it at the bottom of the margin as if to make the paint and go where it belonged back onto the page. Didn't want to walk away with part of David on his finger. You can also see that he attempted to, um, to um, uh, well, protect the image after he realized that a lot of this wetness was causing uh, the facing folio to pick up uh, the dampened paint. And he actually sewed a curtain to the top of the page. You can see the green stitches that are now on the left top part of that page. And that would have protected uh, the, the book. Uh, the curtain's now missing, but the stitches remain. So he wasn't thrilled with the damage that he was giving his book. Now, the owner of this book used a wet finger to venerate an image of Charlemagne. And yeah, Matt's is looking at this. We went to see this in Edinburgh. This is in our very own National Library. Um, it's unpublished. I just ordered this photograph, it just came. And what it shows is a full page image of Charlemagne that somebody has inserted into a late uh, 15th century French book of hours at the calendar. And this image of Charlemagne, he's shown with these six-pack abs um, standing on a pile of armor with all the flags of the territories he's conquered. But you'll also notice that his kneecap is missing um, because the owner has apparently repeatedly wet-touched uh, Charlemagne's knee, possibly in order to reenact the famous scene of Christmas of uh, the year 800 when he was kneeling at uh, an altar and uh, Pope, was it Leo III, came up behind him and plunked the crown onto his head um, and uh, made him emperor at that moment. So uh, by, by touching this kneecap, perhaps the owner of this image is reenacting this, uh, this moment of kneeling. Now, book owners could also reenact or enact future events. And that seems to be the case in this 13th century Psalter. And I'm showing you the opening for the psalm, Salve me fec, or God save me. And here, the owner has touched the initial, this gigantic letter S that fills the left side of the opening, but has also traced this shadowy figure right here, is this figure I'm showing you. Um, that is an image of the penitent um, whom the user has wet touched and pushed up into heaven over and over again. Uh, but what you can see is that now the penitent person is, is completely erased and uh, that the gold stays very much earthbound and all of the paint and the ink um, have flown off to heaven and that the penitent has indeed achieved complete liftoff. <laughs> Now, I've been exploring new ways, new approaches uh, to photographing late medieval manuscripts in order to, um, to try to reveal some of these patterns of wear uh, in, in ways that straight photography hasn't uh, allowed us to do. This straight photography, which is executed mostly by museums and libraries, is often done in order to show collection items in the best possible light, not to show their filth uh, their dirt and their, their patterns of handling. So this is a little book of hours in Dresden that I recently went to see. I took a train all the way to Dresden to reduce my carbon emissions. Um, and you can see that when, when you look at it, it seems, simply looks like uh, an image of the Virgin Lactans opposite a prayer uh, to uh, the Virgin's body parts. But when we look at it with backlighting, here it is with backlighting, and what you can instantly see is that 
the middle part of the image is double thick. It's because the image itself is a print that's been pasted on and painted to look like a miniature. And the second thing you can see with backlighting is that the whole middle of the image, uh, Mary's face and her headscarf, uh, which was blue, has been wet touched, so kissed with a finger until it is nearly worn off. And reviewing that opening again, uh, we can notice that that blue paint from that side is now stuck to the other side. So we can begin to build a history of how this book was important to its user, how its user um, conducted a series of rituals with a wet finger over time. Now, a full page miniature of the same subject appears in the prayer book of Philip the Good. And again, my snapshot on the left reveals more about how the, the, the book was used than the commercial shot that I'm showing you here on the right. Now, to give you some context for Philip the Good, here is uh, an image of Philip in prayer. And he put himself um, in the public arena um, often as a prayerful person, he shows himself in front of his courtiers and makes a, a grand stage of his devotions. And he also prayed with, with quite, a, quite a few histrionics, as I hope to demonstrate. The grime in this particular opening, I think, is very diffuse and it's greasy and it hasn't particularly lifted um, the, uh, the paint from one side to the other. So it's not very wet, it's simply greasy. And to achieve this grime, I suspect that the Duke um, took his, this will stand for the prayer book of Philip the Good, I suspect that he's taken his entire face and buried it in his book, um, thereby suckling on the Virgin Mary's breast alongside the Christ child. Now, and, and which would explain why there's, uh, there's so much dirt, especially at the bottom of this image. He also sewed images, uh, round objects that probably represented Eucharist badges, um, as if placing the Christ child in the form of Eucharist badges uh, with a needle and thread all around the edges of this book. And therefore we get these negative dirt circles where his facial grease couldn't penetrate. Um, what we also see is that, um, uh, that the prayer opposite this is, is a prayer to the Virgin to, to ask for help in, in withstanding temptations of the flesh. Now, at this point, I have to tell you that um, Philip had 26 illegitimate children and 18 <laughs> mistresses, so this particular uh, prayer wasn't very effective. <laughs> Um, but perhaps some of his mistresses used a birthing amulet, such as this one, uh, which is now in Princeton. And it has instructions in French uh, telling the user to take the object and press it onto the abdomen of a woman giving uh, birth. And you can see that it has indeed been used. It's been folded up and pressed, and we have um, some laboring woman's sweat, uh, which has caused a lot of the, the ink to smear uh, and move around. Now, here is uh, the back side of that, which has the measure of Christ's wound, and uh, it's, a, it's a measurement of the, of the pain that Christ felt. Um, as if to, to try to alleviate some of the parchment woman's pain as well. Now, people who didn't have uh, a special folding amulet, like the Princeton amulet, might simply use the image of the Annunciation in their books of hours, uh, like the one I'm showing you here on the right, which is the only very damaged manuscript in this, uh, in this or, uh, image, in this manuscript. And you can, you can see that well, the Annunciation is, is, is almost illegible now, and I suspect that it was used uh, in this way uh, in order to, to try to absorb some of the, the Virgin's um, ability to uh, give birth without pain, which is part of her legend. Now, I want to um, think about how uh, other, other areas of, of life uh, medieval life involved 
uh, acts of touching to, that would take place in, in the presence of the divine. And nowhere is this clearer than in uh, these four openings from a Carolingian gospel manuscript that's now in the Schnutgen Museum in Cologne. Now, in the earlier Middle Ages, the legal system, uh, which was an outgrowth of the church, uh, involved people swearing on, uh, on gospel books such as these. And you'll see that there are handprints at the bottoms of three of the four of these openings, where Matthew at the top left hasn't been very touched, probably because there's an injunction against swearing oaths in the book of Matthew. But, but Mark is a, sort of heavily used, Luke uh, quite a bit with two handprints. And interestingly here at the, uh, the lower right is John, uh, where we get very heavy um, distinctive handprints. And it looks as if there might be two people involved, one at the foot of the image of John and one down here at the corner. So this is a kind of oath where two people are swearing uh, to each other. And we can imagine that, uh, that placing one's hands on books became de rigueur for many official ceremonies, such as the coronation of Charles V, uh, which I'm showing you here. Um, and in this image, the Archbishop uh, of Rams is administering the oath by uh, proffering a book upside down uh, to the newly minted Charles V. And this kind of pattern of wear is exactly what we find in this manuscript, which is a missal. And normally we would expect a gospel manuscript to fulfill this role as an oath manuscript, but it would appear that uh, missiles are all, uh, also used in this way. And you can see that the bottom of the book is completely damaged, as if the officiant were, were extending it forward and really grasping onto it uh, with his hands uh, and, and with a quite tight grip and offering it to somebody who is receiving um, the book on the other end and touching the, the image in the center. Now, the imagery and some of the ritual of gospel manuscripts, missals, and other oath-taking trickled into the secular realm with manuscripts such as this book of civic vows. And it contains the vows for becoming a bailiff, a magistrate, a city tax collector, and so forth. And it is still kept in Sertogenbos, uh, where Hieronymus Bosch comes from. It's still in their courthouse. Um, and it, it's called uh, the Red Velvet Book because it's in a red velvet binding. Now, you can see that many people have touched it once. And the pattern of wear of many people touching once is going to be quite a bit more diffuse than one person touching again and again in the same place, uh, because each person uh, touches it in a slightly different place. But furthermore, you can see that the pattern of wear is such that most of this uh, touching has come from the side. Now, I want to suggest that, um, here, I've made a little mock-up. Uh, I have to stand near my microphone. I've made a little mock-up here, and we can imagine that the official person would have the book in front of him, and that the person taking the oath would stand at the side, and that the official would have to turn the page in order to read uh, the relevant text. And so that the person taking the oath would be touching the image, but not actually looking at it, and have, be having the, the oath read to him or her aloud. Now, a similar practice was adopted for, um, for swearing one's allegiance to a saint in the context of becoming a member of a city club. Now, this is the guild book or the Brotherhood book for the Brotherhood of St. Sebastian in Brussels. And it was a club founded by Charles the Bold around 1470. Now, in order to join this club, one would have to have this book opened in front of him, in front of the other brothers, um, touch the image of St. Sebastian at the middle of the image, touch the image of the Duke, um, who is kneeling on a pillow, and touch his coat of arms, so the, uh, which signifies his rule. 
and then read the oath, which is given in both Latin and vernacular uh, versions, uh, just below the image, and then turn the page to have his name inscribed uh, with the other members of the Brotherhood. Now, all of the notes in the margin of this uh, indicate whether the member is paid up or not, and uh, whether he's still alive with a little X or not. Now, other kinds of oath books for uh, civic brotherhoods um, were connected to, I believe, a shooter's guild, also from uh, Brussels. And we can imagine a shooter's guild having activities such as this, games where uh, all of the shooters are trying to hit a little birdie that's uh, pinned at the top of a windmill uh, that's been extended. I hate to be standing at the bottom of that. Uh, <laughs> but this particular brotherhood also had a guild book, and it looks like this. And it took me a long time to figure out why the image of Saint Sebastian, who is represented not as the victim of being shot, but rather as an archer, uh, which is a real rarity, but his body is completely pitted. And I suspect that the members of this brotherhood would take an arrow and touch the arrow to the image and swear their oath that way, uh, which is why most of his uh, golden armor is now uh, worn off. Touching images in specific ways took place in other secular and social settings. And here I'm showing you a copy of Gautier de Quincy's uh, Miracles of the Virgin. In this image, you see the king acting as prolector, uh, reading aloud uh, from stories that he is uh, using as uh, entertaining edification to a group of listeners. Now, it's uh, possible, it's quite probable, in fact, that this manuscript, which is quite large, would have been used in this way. And I suspect that the prolector also took the book, uh, read from it, and then opened it up and turned it to the audience and used it, uh, used his finger in order to act out uh, the various events that are going on. And I'll show you a, a couple of examples of that. So, for example, one of the stories of the Virgin uh, is uh, the, the miracle of the monk who visits his lover by boat. I always picture Anstruther for some reason. <laughs> I don't know why. Uh, so he's gone to Anstruther in this boat, and at the moment when he reaches the Isle of May, uh, devils come and shake his boat like this, and he gets terribly violently ill. And the prolector then acts out the poor man's uh, being seasick over the side of the boat. Um, but then the prolector also is acting out the part of Mary who squelches the devils and, uh, and she gets rid of, a, particularly the, the brown one on the right, on the left, and, um, and, and he is able to make it back to Anstruther uh, but has to promise never to go to the Isle of May again. Or in this example, uh, which is the story of the illegitimate love child uh, where a, a monk and a woman have uh, had a baby, an unwanted baby, and she is throwing the baby in a toilet. Um, and, but what's interesting about this is that the prolector has uh, negated not the entire character, not negated her, but simply negated uh, her behavior. He has rubbed out her hands as if to show his moral position to her particular act. You can also imagine the audience booing while he's doing this, right? So there's, a, there's an element of, of audience participation here. Or in this manuscript, which is in Vienna, uh, here's a story recounted by Boccaccio, uh, which is the, the story of Anthony who has uh, died, has uh, committed suicide, and Cleopatra um, encounters his, his, uh, his, his body. And she's so uh, upset that she decides to uh, also commit suicide by holding the adder to her breast. And at this moment, the prolector becomes the adder and, uh, and, and squishes the, the, the poisonous snake into her breast, thereby killing her and messing up her paint at the same time. Now, nowhere is this kind of finger performance uh, of the subject more intriguing than in this book, uh, which is the Ramon de la Rose, which depicts nature as a smith. 
And in this image, uh, nature is forging babies by inserting and withdrawing a piece of metal from a furnace and then banging it as hard as he can with a hammer. Now, it seems that the user of this manuscript, or the prolector who is reading out this tale, is helping nature out by vigorously rubbing um, the side of the miniature um, and thereby um, uh, moving up and down um, and, and uh, reiterating the performance that nature is doing here. So the, the knobs on the surface of this, of this background um, have, have drawn the finger of the prolector. Now, the sheer quantity of medieval courtly romance literature that's been deliberately rubbed indicates that prolectors animated the miniatures with their fingers. So this image shows, or these two images both show, um, Lancelot on a white horse who is encountering a weak knight named Agravane. And we can see with these strokes of paint that the prolector has acted out uh, the melee, the scene, and has shown uh, this, with this motion the, the sword of Agravain as it falls to the ground. Now, why would a prolector deliberately abrade the image? And I think it's because the gestures that a prolector would make in doing so would, would both animate the image and enlarge the image as well to a listening public. And I, I have to believe that the medieval readers and listeners would have loved PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, this is one of the strangest um, of all of the examples uh, that where the rituals of oath swearing and the habits of courtly storytelling come together in this book called The Vows of the Peacock. Now, as this story opens, uh, knights and ladies are besieged in a castle, and one of the characters, for fun, strange fun, kills a pet pheasant, or a pet, pet peacock, rather. And another one resurrects the peacock in gold. And that's what we're seeing at the middle of, the, uh, of this image. Now, it depicts men on the left and women on the right of this image. And as the story goes on, the characters decide that they will also take vows on a bird, which is a, a kind of late medieval way of, of taking oaths on a, on a pheasant, on a, on a swan, or indeed on a peacock. And they've all, they all decide to take oaths, oaths to marry or to, to, be, um, to be valorous in battle. Um, but I suspect, given the pattern of wear in this particular manuscript, that the prolector offered it to his audience and that the audience members could pipe in with their own uh, private vows. They could say, I vow to finish my book for ref, or I vow to, uh, to uh, protect pensions or whatever it is that they're, they're going to vow to do. And, and that it becomes then a, a kind of audience participation where people are rallying around a book and all placing their hands on it. Now, it would appear that um, members of the audience were joining in and this is becoming something like a Rocky Horror Picture Show of its time. Now, let me bring this to a close. Reenacting how people handled their books provides insights into the meanings of those books. The study can be quantitative or indeed qualitative. It can reveal the conditions under which rituals took place. It can show the obsessive nature of spiritual torment. It can show the desperation of physical suffering, especially in childbirth and it can reveal the nature of the medieval approach to storytelling. Public activities involving codices in the late Middle Ages all form attempts to make religious devotion, social belonging, um, and, um, and belonging in the context of brotherhoods, as well as civic duties and group entertainment. It all makes this more experiential. That is, I think, the point of uh, drawing people into books and using books as springboards for uh, fingers, for entertainment, for, uh, for displays of devotion. In so doing, uh, all of these actors leave their cumulative marks in the books that provided authoritative structures. Participation in religious and civic life 
makes tangible in history uh, on the books themselves so that um, users become agents of the book's own formation. And I hope that uh, what is, is really essential in, in this kind of study, indeed, is that researchers, that scholars, that students uh, always seek the original documents uh, when trying to build narratives about use history of manuscripts because it's only when studying them in the flesh that they give up their stories. Thank you. Principal, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, and above all, dear Professor Rudy, I think it is fair to say that we all owe Kate a great debt of gratitude, not just for the wonderful lecture she's just delivered, but for the kind of work she's taking upon herself to spare us from having to deal with such ghastly things ourselves. <laughs> for in the course of her scholarly endeavors, Kate is assessing substances as unappetizing as spittle, facial oils, grease, and accretions of sweat and dirt from grubby hands. She's doing work that reminds us more of the gory job of the forensic scientist than of the genteel pursuits of art history. And she's subjecting herself to this in order to explore the behavior of the kind of person who would routinely abuse priceless and beautiful medieval manuscripts and books for individuals who are scraping away at words and illustrations, rubbing out images, scribbling onto unique parchment pages, dubbing ancient manuscripts with wet, ungloved, and unwashed fingers, and paying no heed whatsoever to the needs of con conservation. But the kind of parchment vandals Kate is investigating are not, as you would probably expect, the usual suspects, historians, archivists, genealogists, or librarians, she is unearthing and reconstructing a dimension of the beliefs, behaviors, and passions of medieval men and women. She's teaching us about the individuals whose lives unfolded around the production, veneration, and use of documents that have survived throughout the ages and can now be subjected to scholarly scrutiny. The countless hours Kate has spent with blood, sweat, oils, and tears have proved very fruitful because she has found an exciting revealing and strikingly intimate perspective onto the beliefs, practices, and cultures of our medieval ancestors. Her path-breaking research draws our attention to two fascinating considerations. First, that the medieval engagement with the written word consisted of a much richer and much more multifaceted portfolio of behaviors than the visual cognitive process of a narrowly defined reading activity. It included a much more complete human range involving the physical body with all of its senses, touch, smell, sight, and our mind with its need not just for cerebral nourishment, but also for ritual patterns, magic, and solace. Thus, the physicality of the user of the manuscript and of the manuscript itself is restored to a mutual relationship in a manner that tells us more about both. As a result of Professor Rudy's research, both medieval women and men and their manuscripts are given fuller lives for us to appreciate centuries later. Seemingly dry bookish types and their reading matter are thrown into a tearful, mouth-watering, sweaty relief, a scene brought to life with the imagined sound of fervent weeping, the noise of jabbing or scraping fingers on parchment, and the clicks of books being unclasped. Smearing our fingers across our touch screens, frantically seeking to scratch accidentally uploaded digital photographs of a deeply compromising nature, <laughs> or watching the fading of our smartphone batteries with a resigned sense of eschatological doom, <laughs> we 21st century readers may recognize more of a kinship with Kate's medieval parchment abusers than our parents would have done only 30 years ago. The second thought that Kate's lecture suggested to me is more methodological in nature. In her quest for a better understanding of the past, damage is a friend. Wear and tear and the imperfections brought about by use and abuse, veneration and rejection 
are not seen as deplorable and distorting, but point her to the true place of the beautiful object she investigates in their ambient living cultures. Immaculate preservation and the never been unboxed item in mint condition emerge as sterile, lifeless, and uninteresting. I find this intuitively convincing and very much in keeping with my approach to humanities more broadly and specifically to historical investigation. It's also deeply humane to recognize and celebrate in the occasional scar, the dog-eared page, and the smudged image, the effect of human activity. Perhaps this holds another lesson for this age of airbrushed flawlessness and perennially minty breath. <laughs> Dear Professor Rudy, I'd like to thank you for inviting us into the company of the medieval book lovers that you have done so much to illuminate and explain. You've taught us a great deal about the holistic and surprisingly moist business of medieval <laughs> reading, <laughs> involving as it did the eye, the finger, and the saliva gland. And you have reminded us to cherish the instances of telling damage that are the result of lived passion. Thank you so much.